Week three is in the books. Week four is upon us in the SEC. These are my SEC power rankings entering week four of the 2024 college football season. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Phillips. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications. Check us out via podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us across all social media platforms as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. This segment brought to you by our friends over at Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com, use promo code SECU at sign up to get $50 instantly when you play your first $5 or more lineup. Again, that's prizepicks.com, promo code SECU to get your $50 bonus today. What a wild week three it was as we turn our attention to week four. These are my SEC power rankings after three full complete weeks of play in the Southeastern Conference. As we take a look at each of my selections, we will start at number 16. There is no surprise here. The Mississippi State Bulldogs. You lose by 24 to Toledo. Well, this is what you deserve. We knew year one of Jeff Levy was going to be a struggle. We knew it was going to be up and down. We knew it was going to be a problem. Well, I don't know if anybody saw it being this bad, being down 28 to 3 and losing 41 to 17 to a MAC team on your home field. At number 15, I've got the Florida Gators. Guys, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when with Billy Napier. When he is going to be fired and Florida is going to move on. Of course, the bottom two teams in the power rankings this week will play each other in Starkville in a game that you're a sicko. I'm a sicko. We're all going to be watching this game, but my goodness, you're probably going to feel dirtier after it. Probably going to want to take a shower after you watch this game, to be honest. But either way, the Florida Gators, they fall to one and two. They are 15th in our power rankings. Vanderbilt tumbles down the power rankings at number 14. It's so unfortunate because I was having a lot of fun buying into the Vandy hype. And, you know, who knows how the rest of the season will turn out. But we got robbed of a 3-0 and versus 3-0 and matchup in Como. Vanderbilt falling to Georgia State in Atlanta at Turner Field. The Diego Pavia magic could not quite overcome a late comeback by the Panthers in Atlanta. So Vandy drops to 14. At number 13, I got the Kentucky Wildcats. I understand Kentucky took Georgia down to the wire, but I'm more so concerned about the offensive side, guys. This is a team that has not scored an offensive touchdown in their last two games. Got throttled by South Carolina, and then again, could not punch the ball in against a really, really good Georgia defense. But still, no offensive touchdowns in two games. I still like the defensive personnel, but Kentucky for me, guys, right now, is it 13? They look to be much, much worse than I thought they were going to be before the season began. And number 12, I've got the Arkansas Razorbacks. Coming off a a sluggish performance against UAB, I, I'm not looking much into it. Uh, you know, I, I think, honestly, Arkansas probably overlooking the opponent. You know, maybe a little bit of a hangover after the Oklahoma State loss in Stillwater. Going to find a lot, out a lot more about the Hogs this weekend when they travel to the Plains Uh, Still like Taylor Green, Jaquindon Jackson, that offense. I think defensively with Travis Williams, they're solid as well. But kind of a ho-hum, whatever. Did not look really good against UAB. But again, I don't don't put too much stock in that. We'll find out a lot more this weekend. Speaking of that team, they're going to play on the Plains. I've moved Auburn up to number 11. And one of the biggest reasons I've done that, guys, it is very well documented. I was not a Peyton Thorne guy. I had Peyton Thorne 16th. And my quarterback power rankings entering the season. Insert Hank Brown. Change of optimism for me when it comes to Auburn football. I know it was New Mexico, but I liked what I saw from Hank Brown. Very efficient with the football. You know, that everybody I talked to says he's a gunslinger. You saw that in that game against New Mexico. Pushed the football down the field, was on time, in rhythm, had four touchdown passes. And maybe more importantly, guys, zero interceptions. And it sounds like Auburn is all in on Hank Brown moving forward, being the guy for not just this week against Arkansas, but for the entire season. So if they've got the quarterback situation figured out, and if just Hank Brown is, guys, if he's serviceable, all of a sudden there's new optimism and there's new life for this Auburn Tigers football program in 2024. Again, we're going to find out a lot more this weekend, 11 versus 12. It's going to be a fascinating matchup, but I move Auburn up because I find myself having more excitement and more optimism with a new signal caller under center. At number 10, I've got the South Carolina Gamecocks. Heartbreak at williams Bryce Stadium. It was heartbreak. Again, we were there in person, obviously, witnessing this game. I actually leave this game feeling a little bit better 
about what South Carolina is. Um, you know, I, it's unfortunate the injury to Lenore Sellers. You hope that he can come back and has a speedy recovery, but it felt like with every passing drive, he gets more and more confident and more and more comfortable in the offense. Obviously, a very, a very young player. The passing game is not quite there, even with Sellers in it. I think that's going to continue to develop. Uh, they're a much different team with Robbie Ashford. Uh, simply put, they're just not very good on offense with Robbie Ashford. So you got to keep the fingers crossed. Hope Lenora Sellers gets back again sooner rather than later. The defense is for real, guys. Listen, I'm not one of these people. I saw some saying you got to put South Carolina ahead of LSU because they got robbed. I'm not going back down that rabbit hole again. Uh, I don't believe in ranking teams ahead of other teams when you literally just saw it play out on the field and you lost. With that being said, though, what's getting overshadowed, I think there's a lot of reasons to be excited about South Carolina, and I think they're going to give a lot of teams headaches this season. That, to me, looks like a team that is going to a bowl game, right? And I'm not, I'm not sure that we thought that or were saying that after week one, just a couple weeks ago. Number nine, I got the Oklahoma Sooners. The defense is fantastic. The offense is still a major question mark. Uh, when Jackson Arnold is your leading rusher on your football team and they're so banged up on the offensive side, the offensive line's been inconsistent, um, they need playmakers to step up, right? Jackson Arnold's been inconsistent. It, it, it's just there's a whole heck of a lot more questions than there are answers on the offensive side of the football. Uh, we're going to find out a lot more this weekend just how ready Oklahoma is for SEC play when they take on the Tennessee Volunteers in Norman. We all know college game day is going to be there, going to be an electric atmosphere. But Oklahoma has just got to figure it out on the offensive side, right? I mean, you get a nice win against Tulane. I, I didn't think you would cover, and you did. But still, you look at the numbers, and it's ugly offensively. If they can get the offense and become a more balanced football team because they've got the defense, I genuinely believe this is going to be one of the best defenses in the conference. If they can find some offensive rhythm or some answers on the offensive side, they're going to be really dangerous. But it's a big if, because Oklahoma, admittedly, guys, looks a lot like what a lot of us thought they would. The offensive line is struggling. Thus, Jackson Arnold is struggling. Thus, you're not seeing offensive production. That's just kind of what Oklahoma is right now. And number eight, I've got Texas A&M. I think Texas A&M with Marcel Reed at quarterback, really dangerous on the offensive side. I think he's a much better fit for that scheme and that system and what Colin Klein wants to do in the system. They look more exciting to me. It looks like a more fun brand of football with Marcel Reed in the game, him using his running abilities. Uh, you know, the continued search for that top wide out on the outside. Cyrus Allen had a big game, obviously, in Gainesville. Who's going to be that top guy for them moving forward? Uh, Le'Veon Moss was really good toting the rock for them. You know, listen, I know Florida's in disarray, but that's a quality win to go into Gainesville. You knew Florida, a desperate football team. They absolutely had to have that game, and you're able to go in and put your foot on their throat and really not let off. I mean, that game, you know, it was 20 to nothing. They sucked the air right out of that building. Great job by AM. and they've done a good job of bouncing back since that week one loss to Notre Dame. So, again, they got Bowling Green this week, and they can continue to build the momentum. And I like what they're doing offensively with Marcel Reed at quarterback. How do they handle it the rest of the way? Does Marcel Reed take over full-time as QB1? What do they do when Connor Wigman is 100% fully healthy, comes back for the injury? We'll see. But I like it. I like Marcel Reed at quarterback for them. I think he's a much better fit for what Colin Klein really, truthfully, wants to do. Uh, and number seven, I've got the LSU Tigers. They don't move for me at all. You know, again, I, I will say this. I think the thing that is being missed, because we've spent so, so much time, and I'm not talking referees anymore. I'm just not doing it, guys. Time to build a bridge and get over it. But I'll say this. You got to give a lot of credit to LSU for even putting themselves in position to have a chance to go down the field and win that ball game with a minute left. You're down 17 0 in a hostile environment. I mean, guys, an insane asylum it was, Williams Bryce Stadium. I say that complimentary. One of the best environments you're ever going to see. To be down 17 0 and be able to scratch and claw and fight and show that resiliency and come back and win a game like that, it really, truly speaks to the culture within that building and within that LSU program. So uh, they got things to clean up. Garrett Nussmeyer's got to be much better. He's got to take care of the football. I thought they made nice adjustments in the second half against South Carolina, started stretching the field, exposing the middle of the field. Uh, you know, the, the, the young running back, Caden Durham, needs to get more touches, along with Josh Williams and Caleb Jackson. And defensively, you know, LSU's just kind of kind of be what they are. You know, the interior of the defense is is, is something that they're going to have to continue to work on and, and try to shore up. But LSU's going to have to score points to win. 
you got a couple weeks, right? UCLA, South Alabama, bye week. You got a couple weeks to figure some things out, get some kinks ironed out, get some things rolling before Ole Miss comes to town. It kind of feels like a new season for LSU, right? New opportunity, a new breath of life into the season after beating South Carolina. But LSU, I'm still kind of, I feel like they have a lot of talent. This team is certainly capable of getting to a college ball playoff, but right now I'm leaving it at seven just because, you know, I, I still need some more answers, right? I, I need to see more from the LSU Tigers. Number six, I got the Missouri Tigers. Speaking of the other Tigers, uh, quality top 25 win over Boston College. Listen, I know they were they were big-time favorites, and BC went up 14-0. I thought Mizzou showed a lot of resiliency coming back in that football game. And, you know, Boston College is a good football team. Like, they've got a quarterback who's annoying. He's hard to prepare for. He's hard to defend in Castellanos. I thought Missouri, once they settled in the game, you know, I think moving forward for them, there, there's definitely some things they need to clean up. There were some busts in the secondary, just some sloppy play early on. Uh, and I thought the defense got tested, right? And they'll get another test this weekend against Vandy with Diego Pavia and what he can do. But, you know, all in all, a quality win. You beat a top 25 opponent. I give Missouri a lot of credit for that. At number five, the Alabama Crimson Tide. Boy, they just dismantled Wisconsin. I mean, Jalen Milrow looked fantastic. Once they knocked Tyler Van Dyke out of that game early, guys, it was it was going to be tough sledding for the Badgers, right? So, as you're going to notice, the, the top six or seven for me, I kept exactly the same. Everyone won. Everyone essentially took care of the business, so there's really no movement here. But Alabama is certainly one of the most impressive teams in week three with that big-time win uh, there at Camp Randall. And number four, I got the Tennessee Volunteers. Again, ho-hum. You beat Kent State, what was it, 71 nothing? It's like 56 nothing at half. You got Josh Heupel out here, uh, uh, onside kicking, up 30 to nothing, which apparently was pre-planned and pre-scripted, so give him credit for that. But we're going to find out a lot more about Nico Iamaleava and this Tennessee team this weekend when they go to Norman to take on Oklahoma. Biggest test in Nico's career, right? Going on the road, this environment he's stepping into, Made a, made a couple mistakes against NC State. Do we see that come up again, and will it hurt Tennessee this time? Because it didn't, obviously, against the Wolfpack. So, anyways, Tennessee's one of the hottest teams in college football. I'm keeping them in that four spot for now. Big opportunity this weekend. Number three, the Ole Miss Rebels. Same thing, guys. They're a wagon right now. Bet on them to cover every week. Uh, I had them at the minus 24 against Wake Forest. They win the game by 34 points. And then after the game, you got Jackson Dart saying that we're not playing up to our standard. That game was not to our standard. So that just goes to show you how much Ole Miss is rolling. Um, we will finally get to see them play a team with a pulse in a couple weeks when they dive into conference play. I'm still obviously a huge believer in this Ole Miss team. I love this roster. I love this personnel, but can't move them up and certainly not going to move them down because – you know, just the level of competition. It is what it is. And they got Georgia Southern this week, and that'll be another massive blowout game and another game for them to build confidence before they finally dive into SEC play. Number two, I've got the Texas Longhorns. Now, there's going to be some disagreement here because Texas is now number one in the AP poll. I do not care. I do not care, okay? Texas looked great against UTSA. That's awesome. Arch Manning. Looked incredible. Some people think that Texas, some people have gone on record and said Texas is a better football team with Arch Manning under center. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but it goes to show the talent the kid has. I'm keeping Texas in the two spot. They look fantastic. They look great. They're going to look great again this weekend when they take on La Monroe and General Booty as they come to Austin. I'm keeping Georgia in the one spot, guys. Here's why. I'm not overreacting to one game in Lexington. Guys, Like we've seen this song and dance when it comes to the Georgia Bulldogs. Have we not? We have seen this play out when it comes to Georgia. I don't know why anyone would overreact to what we saw in Lexington. Last year, it was the Auburn game. A couple years ago, it was Missouri on the road. Like, I, I'm just, I refuse to overreact. And again, these power rankings for me, these teams played on a neutral site. Who's going to win? I still think Georgia, Texas on a neutral site, I'd have a hard time picking against Georgia. Because, again, I'm just not overreacting to Georgia going on the road, playing one of their – the difference between Georgia and a middle-of-the-pack SEC team or certainly lower third, they can play their C-minus game and still win. And that's what you saw from Georgia. So – um, I think Kirby Smart loves it. I think he loves the fact they're number two in the AP poll. They're number one in my power rankings, but I think he absolutely loves the fact that now, 
you know, people are doubting them. And now he, you know, the best thing for Kirby, teaching moment after a win, you can, you can refocus your guys, say, hey, look, look, we're not perfect. These are the things we got to work on. We got to correct. I think Georgia's going to be fine. And again, they found a way to go on the road in the SEC, get a dub. I don't care who it was against. There's no such thing as a bad road win in the SEC. So for right now, I am going to keep Georgia at number one in the power rankings. I'm not overreacting to a tight win in Lexington. So guys, do you agree with me? Do you disagree? How would you power rank the teams of the SEC entering week four of the 2024 college football season? Guys, that's going to do all for me. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in again. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications. Check us out via podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us across all social media platforms as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. Until next time, guys, I'm Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in, and we'll catch you on the other side.